100th Street in Manhattan. I'm Pastor Heidi Newmark, and I'm here with our Director of Music, Mr. Horace Beasley, our intern, Vicar Shruti Kulkarni, our seminarian, Alyssa Terry, and our cameraman, Jim Mullen. Blessed be the Holy Trinity, one God, whose steadfast love is everlasting, whose faithfulness endures from generation to generation. Amen. Amen. Pray with me. Did you rise this morning, broken and hung over with weariness and pain, and rage tattered from waving too long in a brutal wind? Get up, child. Pull your bones upright. Gather your skin and muscle into a patch of sun. Draw breath deep into your lungs. You will need it, for another day calls to you. I know you ache. I know you wish the work were done. And you, with everyone you have ever loved, we're on a distant shore, safe and unafraid. But remember this, tired as you are, you are not alone. Here and here and here also, there are others weeping and rising and gathering their courage. You belong to them and they to you, and together we will break through and bend the arc of justice all the way down into our lives.
the grace of our Lord Jesus Christ, the love of God, and the communion of the Holy Spirit be with you all. Like a mama bird who has found a nest for her baby chicks, God, you provide a safe and warm place for me, your child. from Exodus chapter 19. The Israelites had journeyed from Rephidim, entered the wilderness of Sinai, and camped in the wilderness. Israel camped there in front of the mountain. Then Moses went up to God. The Lord called to him from the mountain saying, Thus you shall say to the house of Jacob, and tell the Israelites, you've seen what I did to the Egyptians and how I bore you on eagles' wings and brought you to myself. Now, therefore, if you obey my voice and keep my covenant, you shall be my treasured possession out of all the peoples. Indeed, the whole earth is mine but you shall be for me a priestly kingdom and a holy nation. These are the words that you shall speak to the Israelites. So Moses came, summoned the elders of the people and set before them all these words that the Lord had commanded him. The people all answered as one, Everything that the Lord has spoken, we will do.
worry about how you are to speak or what you are to say, for what you are to say will be given to you at that time. For it is not you who speak, but the Spirit of your Father speaking through you. Holy wisdom, holy word. Praise to you, O Christ. household of Israel. 
Ibram Kendi has some interesting things to say about self-interest and racism. Some of you will remember that we were planning to have a conversation about Kendi's most recent book, How to Be an Anti-Racist, but then the coronavirus diverted our attention and ability to gather. Maybe we should try again by Zoom. His words in an earlier book, stamped from the beginning, are useful as we consider this passage from Exodus and Moses' call to move beyond tending to his self-interest to further liberating work. We have been taught, says Kendi, that ignorance and hate lead to racist ideas and racist policies. If the fundamental problem is ignorance and hate, then your solutions are going to be focused on education and love and persuasion. But the actual foundation of racism is not ignorance and hate, but self-interest, particularly economic and political and cultural. Self-interest drives racist policies that benefit that self-interest. When the policies are challenged because they produce inequalities, racist ideas spring up to justify those policies. Hate flows freely from there. He gives examples. The Portuguese had to justify their pioneering slave trade of African people before the Pope. Out of that self-interest, economic self-interest, came the racist idea that Africans are barbarians. If we remove them from Africa and enslave them, they could be civilized. Kendi then relates this to the slave trade in this country. I'm enslaving people because I want to make money. That's my self-interest. Abolitionists are resisting me, so I'm going to convince Americans that these people should be enslaved because they're black. And then people will start believing these ideas, that these people are so barbaric that they need to be enslaved. Before Moses is able to be a liberator, his economic and cultural self-interest is challenged. His loss of income to embrace this new work is a kind of reparations. He will no longer be working for his father-in-law Jethro, for his family, for his self-interest alone. He will move from shepherding Jethro's flock to shepherd God's people who are enslaved. He will take on the interest of those he has been cut off from, his real kin. Jesus calls it loving your neighbor as yourself. Now back at Sinai, these people who are liberated and yet exhausted from their wilderness journey and the trials and the troubles they face need to know that they are loved and precious because knowing you are loved makes all the difference. But it's not meant to entrench self-interest and self-regard in a I'm number one kind of way. I'm so precious and you're not. It's meant to strengthen them and to form them in love for God's bigger project for all nations, for all peoples, for all the earth. In our gospel, Jesus is seeking shepherds interested in God's greater flock too. When he saw the crowds, he had compassion for them because they were harassed and helpless like sheep without a shepherd. And so he sends the disciples out to take up this holy work, cure the sick, raise the dead, cleanse the lepers, and cast out demons. What? That's not possible. How can we do that? Can we cure the sickness of racism? Can we cast out 
the demons of white supremacy, even as they prance and gloat and tweet and plan rallies, can we raise the dead? I will be with you, God, told Moses. I will be with you, Jesus, told his disciples. Then and now. Matthew's gospel does not downplay the difficulties. He mentions those who will refuse to listen, who will see it all as fake news. The gospel mentions hostile governors and kings, hateful, cynical, violent attempts at quashing the movement. He quotes Jesus saying, I will send you out like sheep in the midst of wolves. And the wolves will not all appear to be wolves. I've been hearing about some ugly and unashamed racism in both Upper West Side and Upper East Side moms groups. We've seen it with Amy Cooper in Central Park. We need to be aware of wolves who masquerade as sweet white sheep hiding the fangs and claws of their racism. In our Exodus story, when the people hear the call to use their spiritual privilege as God's beloved for the sake of others, they answer as one, everything that the Lord has spoken, we will do. Everything that the Lord has spoken, we will do. Hmm. I imagine you can guess how that went. I didn't read from our second lesson from Romans, but in it, St. Paul says, We know God's love because while we were still sinners, Christ died for us. We are justified by faith, not works. We stand in the grace of God, which doesn't mean we don't do works. Our Exodus reading puts it in a different, more poetic way. You have seen what I did to the Egyptians and how I bore you on eagles' wings and brought you to myself. To understand what this means, it helps to read another Eagle Wings reference in the book of Deuteronomy, chapter 32, where God is described, again, as a mother eagle. Like the eagle that stirs up her nest and hovers over her young, God spreads wings to catch you and carries you on pinions. The biblical writers had observed the behavior of mother eagles. When it was time for the little eagle chicks to leave their nest and learn to fly, the mother would stir up her nest and basically push the babies out. Most of the time they were instinctually able to flap their little wings and fly, as baby birds do. But sometimes, something didn't go right, and a baby eaglet would flail and fail and fall, falling and falling until it would crash. But as soon as the mother eagle saw this was about to happen, she would swoop under the baby eagle with her strong, broad wings and catch it and bear it up to safety so it could live to fly another day. When the biblical writers saw the mother eagle doing this, they saw an image of God's mercy and grace and love come to rescue us, to catch us and lift us to try again. 
We can't count on perfection. If we want to be perfect, we might as well not get up in the morning or try anything. But that does not mean that we cannot hope and work for real change and real progress. We will make mistakes. We will flail and fail and fall. But we have a God who comes to catch us and lift us up in order that we may keep on, in order that we may fly. Most pastors, and perhaps some of you, have been with a dying person who has remarked on the others they see in the room with them. I've been with people near death who tell me about people in the room that I can't see, yet the dying person sees as clear as day a loved one who surely cannot be physically present because they've died, and yet the dying see them as if they're there, as sure as the bed they lie in or the chair I sit in. It's like they have come to accompany the dying person and lead them on their final journey. When George Floyd cried out for his mama, that's what I thought of. I believe he saw her coming to him, ready to bear him up on her eagle's wings and carry him home. Jesus sent her to him. And when we flail and when we fail, the mother eagle will appear for us, spreading out her strong, broad wings to catch us and carry us that we can carry on until the day when all God's beloved children are liberated from under the boots and bullets of Pharaoh's armies, until all God's beloved children are free, fly free. Amen.
The Beatitudes for June 2020. Blessed are you who can't turn off the news, for you will find peace. Blessed are those screaming in the streets day after day, for they will necessitate justice. Blessed are you still sheltering to protect someone you love, for you will be loved back in full. Blessed are those who mourn life and liveliness, lost to the scourge of state-sanctioned violence, for they will be comforted. Blessed are we when we start to peel back the corners on the toxic and destructive things we've been taught, for we will be shown hard truths. Blessed are those hiding in bunkers, for they too will have to emerge into the light of the world to come. Blessed are the vulnerable, Black bodies, sick bodies, bodies with pre-existing conditions, bodies at the bottom of the ventilator priority list, for they will be made strong. Blessed are the voices of journalists, authors, poets, scientists, public health officials, church leaders, and those who decenter their voice sometimes, for they will lead the way. Into your hands, O Lord, we commend all for whom we pray, trusting in your mercy through your Son, Jesus Christ, our Lord. Amen. May the peace of Christ be with you. This is the time we would normally receive our offering, and we are grateful to everyone who has sent us offerings um, and continue to do that. And if you would like to do so this morning online, you can check in the comment section and there's a link where you could do that. Of course, you can also mail offerings to the church. Let us sing give thanks with a grateful heart.
us. May God look upon us with favor and give us peace. Happy birthday to Pierina, and I would also like to share the wonderful news with you that Pierina has launched her campaign to run for city council representing the district in the Bronx where she lived and grew up with her family, uh, and uh, I would pray that that campaign and witness will bear fruit and multiply justice and goodness in this city as I am sure that it will. Let's sing Happy Birthday to Pierina. Happy birthday. 